Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, good evening, good evening, physics fans. It's Wednesday night and it's time for some physics. Um, we're going to do lenses this evening. As the title suggested on the splash before we started, this is episode one. We've got a lot to cover tonight. Lenses is a very, very large topic. Uh, before I do that though, a little bit of a change to our, our layout. Uh, if you're a regular to the stream, so you should hopefully see the chat live on the left hand side. Let me know if that doesn't actually work because my setup um, at my house looks a little bit different. Okay, on to lenses. Essentially lenses um, are just Kind of an interesting form of refraction. Okay, so from last week, if we look at our prism, if I had a ray of light that was traveling towards a, a triangular prism like that, then what you would expect is you're moving from air into glass, so you'd get some form of refraction. So you'd do the kind of sensible thing, you'd draw your normal in like that, and you'd have your light slow down and bend towards the normal, and then draw your second normal on the way out. And if this doesn't make sense to you, this is your first time here, um, just Pop onto the uh, pop onto the channel. You'll see last week or two weeks ago uh, we did re reflection refraction of light. But um, if I did this, I get this. I kind of get a bend downwards and a bend downwards again, and that's standard refraction. Now, if I get uh, the exact same prism and I turn it upside down like that and stick it to the bottom, I get this kind of shape. So if another ray of light was coming this way, then the exact opposite situation happens. It bends that way and then it bends downwards again and on the way out it kind of goes like that. Now the critical thing here is that what we've done is we've made two rays of light that were travelling parallel to each other and were never ever ever going to meet bend in such a way that they overlap here. Okay? What we've done is we've taken parallel rays of light and brought them to a single point and we call that bringing them to a focus. Now that single point is a very specific place. After that, they spread out again and go on their separate ways. If I was to get um, some form of screen, so let's get ourselves a little screen here, colour it in, be a light grey. Um, but if I was to put that screen there, what I get is I get two dots. I'll send at the back before I do anything else. If I were to put that screen there, then my two rays of light would form two distinct dots of light on this screen, which is no different to what they would have done anyway. But if I move that screen forward and forward and forward and forward and forward, eventually there comes a point here where I get a single bright dot of light. I get a really sharp focused point of light and that's what we mean by focusing light. That at a specific place we've got the light at a single point. All right, But that's two upside down prisms stuck together. What's that got to do with lenses? Well essentially a convex lens is just two upside down prisms stuck together. It's just done so in a bit more of a curvy way that instead of it being two triangles we have it as this kind of elongated oval. But the idea is much the same that it has a pointy bit at the top and it widens out towards the bottom. So it basically behaves like a prism. You've got a pointy bit at the top, wider at the middle. Pointy bit at the bottom, wider at the middle. And that's what we're after. Okay, so from here on in we'll draw them, kind of try to draw them sensibly. And the important thing now is terminology. Most people are pretty good at lenses. It's what's the difference between a focal point and a focal length? What do you mean by the optical centre? What's 2F? What's all this stuff that's going on? Um, so let's try and get that sorted out. There are some things that you have to know. Okay, first of all, the lens has a middle point. Right, the absolute centre point of the lens. Assuming that it's reasonably symmetrical, that's going to be here. Now, the centre of the lens is kind of handily actually just called the optical centre. That takes a little bit of writing, so we just call it O. Good so far? Hope so, anyway. Right. Then, along O, we can draw a couple of lines. We can draw a line that kind of runs out of it parallel and then a straight up and down li uh, line through O that goes through the tip and bottom of your lens. Oh, I slightly missed with my dot. That's okay, that's not too bad. Okay, so if we draw this, we end up with kind of a graph axis here. This horizontal one, I, I hate to use the word horizontal because you could turn the lens anyway, but this uh, line that isn't the one that goes through tip and tail, this is called the principal axis. Okay, 
Um, and this is where all the action happens. This is where you do all your calculations and where all you do all your measurements from. That's why it's important. Okay. Now, from O out to a certain point, there is the focal point, and F is the designation we give for the focal point. We'll just put down here that F equals the focal point. And the focal point is very, very, very specifically um, set. It, the focal point is the point where if you had parallel rays of light, so let's get some, some rays of light coming in. If you had parallel rays of light coming into your lens, like this, the focal point is the point that they all end up traveling through. Okay, so another parallel ray comes in here, hits the lens, ends up being forced through that. They all, if they're parallel, they end up going through F. That's what makes it special. If they're not parallel, like come up like that there, they could go anywhere, right? Like out there, don't know, don't know. But what I do know is that if a ray of light arrives parallel to the principal axis, and that's the important bit, it's parallel to the principal axis because these two rays here that I'm about to draw, these ones are parallel, but I don't know where they're going. But any ray that's parallel to the principal axis ends up traveling through the focal point F. And we're going to use that um, as an idea later on. All right, so that's going to be a certain thing. Then, really importantly now, this is the distinction that most people fail to make. This distance here, the distance from the optical center to the focal point, is called the focal length. All right? Sometimes given a little f, but we're going to leave that out for now. So we put that there, focal length. Happy enough? Hope so. Now, since our kind of westernized way of reading stuff implies that you go from left to right, um, then this looks sensible. But there's no reason why light couldn't come from the right in through the left. And any ray of light that would come along parallel to the principal axis would be forced through a focal point on the other side. And since this lens is symmetrical, that means that we can put another focal point, F, on the other side. And its focal length is going to have to be exactly the same as it was before. Okay, so there's, I get that lined up okay. So there's the focal length put in. So we need another little tick down here for the focal, for the focal point. And this is us building up our lens diagram. And I'm just going to take out this little arrow here because things get, might get a little bit annoying. Okay, now we're pretty much done at that point, but there is one other interesting place that we'll come back to later in the video, um, which is that twice the focal length is kind of interesting in certain cases. So we're going to pop it in as well, which comes out here, and this is imaginally called twice the focal point, so it just gets a 2 put in front of it. Nice algebra, it's 2f. Right. Seem reasonable? And then on the other side, we have exactly the same thing going on. We've got 2f on the other side because light could come from either side of the lens. And this is our kind of standard lens setup. Happy enough. And this is what you tend to get as your diagram in your exam. And in fact, in the exam, they don't even bother drawing the lens in. They take it out, and instead of doing the whole lens, they just draw in the top of the lens, which means that this ends up as a little pointy out arrow, and this ends up as a little pointy out arrow because the end of a convex lens is pointy out. And that's it. Okay, with this nicely labeled as O. So quick recap, O is the optical center, F is the focal point, and exists on both sides because of the fact that you can send light either way. 2f is twice the focal length away, so it's the double focal point. And the focal point is only special because any ray of light that travels along and hits your lens, if it's traveling parallel to the principal axis, it will travel through f. If it's not traveling parallel to the principal axis, I have absolutely no idea where it's going to go. But I can use this later on. All right, so what's the purpose of a lens? Right, the purpose of a lens is generally to make an object appear somewhere else. Okay, it's to make the object bigger or smaller or magnified or closer or further away. It's to, it's to take an object that was somewhere and make it appear to be somewhere else. If you're um, super uh, short-sighted, then having the entire world come a bit closer to you would be useful. 
So that's what a lens does. If you're long-sighted, moving the world, moving the close-up world away from you, so that you can have a look at it, is important. Um, if you're trying to look at, uh, if you're really old and you're trying to look at really fine point, and you get the magnifying glass out. That's a lens, um, and what it's doing is simply making a new image, making your eyes kind of get weird. Okay. So uh, let's put ourselves an object and see how this works. Right, so let's imagine that we have this object here. In fact, we're not going to do this object. We're going to do this object. We'll start complicated and then we'll work our way down. Okay, drawing lens diagrams has two rules. If you learn these two rules, you, you don't go wrong with lens diagrams. Rule one, light parallel to the principal axis is, is refracted or bent through F. Okay, like we've already said that. Two. We haven't said this already. Light traveling through O is undeviated. If that means it doesn't, it doesn't change direction. On these two rules, we can work out everything else that we want to find out about this. Where does a sharp image get, um, get made? Okay, two rays of light. So light parallel to the principal axis is refracted through F. Light traveling through O is undeviated. Right, so onward and outwards. Let's get ourselves some light. So every single part of this object is going to give out light. I can see the object, therefore it's either making its own light or it's refracting light all over the place. One of the two is true. All right, so this, this little bottom part of the, of, the, of the object is firing light out in every which direction. Right? Any conceivable direction you want to pick, you know, into the page, out of the page, into the screen, all over the shop, there's light going every which way. And the same is true for every single other point. And that's going to mess our diagram up horribly, so we're going to concentrate on two. There's a ray of light going that way, 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 that way. You get the point. But there's definitely one going that way. And that's the one that interests me, because this ray of light fulfills the first criteria. It's light parallel to the principal axis. And therefore, I know where this ray ends up. It goes parallel to the principal axis and then gets refracted through the point F, like that. Now, if you get a stingy examiner, you'll lose a mark if you don't put your, ray, uh, put your arrows onto your rays of light, because you have to show where they're coming from and where they're going to. All right, so once again, we know that there's rays of light coming there, 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 but there's also definitely one going through O. And from our second point, light traveling through O is undeviated, I can keep that traveling along this way. All right, so let's just line that up nicely. And let's keep this going. And here we see that we get a crossover point. That's all right, that's not bad, it's 3F. And our crossover point is here. Now what that means is that these rays of light came from the exact same point, right? The exact same tip of our little object and they will be back at the exact same point over here. So this is the perfect spot for me to form an image. If I put a screen at this point here, I will get a nice, perfect, sharp image of that head there. Okay. If I put a, if I put a screen here, I'll get a blurry thing because I've got two rays of light where there should only be really one point. Um, so, so that would mess you up a little bit. But here is the perfect point for focus. All right, so that's the top of my image. I'll just label that in, that's the top. And I'll get, out of, get rid of a couple of these little extra things here. And I'll move this round to the other side to give myself space. Now let's go from the bottom of our object and do the exact same process because there's no, nothing special about top or bottom. There's light going this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. You get the point now. There's also one going parallel to the principal axis. Rule one, light parallel to the principal axis is refracted through F. So we take this and we refract it through F like this. Okay. And we draw our arrows on because we're good students. And we'll come back to that other one here. And we also know that there's a ray of light coming from this point that is going to go through O, the optical center. I play nice and chat, just having a quick glance over. We're all friends here trying to learn physics. Okay, so that's roughly a crossover point for here. So if I go, right, this comes from down here at this perfect point and rearranges itself up here at this perfect point, then this is where the bottom of my image is going to be. Does that seem reasonable? 
All right, Kevin, mind yourself some. All right, so I've got the top and bottom of my image. So what I end up with is I could do the same for every single point along this whole thing and I would end up making an image that looked like that. Okay, I would get a much bigger arrow on the other side here. Okay, and that's only because of where I put it. And I can say some things about this image and there are some rules that go with this. So let's comment on it. We first of all know it's bigger. Not good enough to say bigger, that doesn't sound very um, kind of annoying. Uh, it doesn't sound like you're, you're talking about physics, you're talking about you know just other stuff. So we want to say, if we're saying bigger in physics, we say magnified. Okay, sounds more impressive. So we've got a magnified image. Okay, it's upside down. But we can't say it's upside down, that would be silly. We say it's inverted. All right, now where is it? The interesting thing here is that it's formed beyond 2f. It's formed further away than it was in the first place. Okay, it, it was between f and 2f when I actually had the object. The image is much further away. All right, and finally, it is real. Of course, it's real. It's there. But what do we mean? What we mean by real is that actual light arrives there. Okay, it's not an optical illusion. It's not like your mirror in your bedroom. Okay, that if somebody comes in from a completely different angle and looks at this, they will see the exact same thing that you see. Do you understand? Okay, that it's something that other observers can see. It's not like the mirror where if you're looking at the mirror and somebody else is looking from a different angle, they see something completely different. This setup here, for those of you doing triple award, is the basis of an overhead uh, of a projector. You take an object at close range and you make it larger and further away. So that's how your your data projector in school works. And you know, for the interactive whiteboard, the screen's kind of small, the little bulb up there is tiny, but the image in the screen is enormous. That's this. Are we happy? Good. I'm hoping so anyway. And then all you have to do is be able to do this for all the different types. Now, thankfully, examiners are a little bit kind on this one. What they tend to do is ask you this question. So we'll set this up one more time, just with a slightly different setup. I'm just going to grab a few of the, whoop, just grab the labels along here because they're a little bit handier to nick. Fire those on. That's not bad. We'll do there. I'll get rid of this. Okay, now let's put our object somewhere else. Let's put our object like just over here, just slightly beyond 2F this time. This time what we've got is we've got the object actually sitting on the principal axis. And that's the more common exam question to get. But you deal with it exactly the same way. Start at the top, rays of light, whichever way you want, but you want one from the principal, uh, one traveling parallel to the principal axis that gets forced through F. You then want another one that travels through the optical center O and you find your crossover point. Boom, like that. Now you sh you're probably immediately thinking, right, well, let's, let's do the bottom one as well because you know that's what we've just done in our previous example. But I have no need to. Well, first of all, I have no ability to because a ray of light coming from the bottom, um, the one that goes parallel to the principal axis actually goes through O. All right, so that's a bit of a problem. So finding the bottom of this is basically impossible. What we can do is we can take one slightly further up, we can go parallel to the principal axis and travel through F like that, and then we can go like this and we can find somewhere midway up like that. But we're not going to do that, we don't need to. What we know is that if the object is sitting on the principal axis, the bottom of the object will be sitting on the principal axis as well, and since we've already located where the top is, we know that the bottom is going to sit down here too, so we can just draw that straight away, and that will be full marks. But commenting on this would be different. Once again, we have a real image because actual light arrives there. Okay, again, it's inverted. But this time, when we were beyond 2f, we go uh, our image is formed between f and 2f, which sort of makes sense because if you ran this one backwards, you would expect to end up with this. Like the light would have to come back through here and would have to do that again. And then finally, instead of being magnified this time, it's smaller. Uh, we don't say smaller, we say diminished. Is that all right? 
Happy? I hope so anyway. I hope so. The basic deal is with these. Now there's a special point at 2F um, that when you put something at 2F it ends up at 2F on the other side which is kind of cool. But the more interesting one um, is what happens when it's closer than F and when it's at F. And this is what we're going to take a look at now. Okay, so can I paste that back again and we'll get our we'll get ourselves going. Do, 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 do. So make myself a new set of axes. Whoop. Get a principal axis in, pop it down with my F, my 2F and so forth. And then I want a convex lens somewhere around about here. Okay, arrows outwards to show that we're dealing with a convex lens. Next week we'll deal with concave lenses, the divergent lenses. Uh, they're a little bit more interesting. But let's pop ourselves a little object here. In fact, I'll make it a little object for reasons that will become clear shortly. Okay, let's do it. Rule one, ray of light parallel to the principal axis, pushed through F. Ray of light number two, through O. And we immediately run into a problem. That these rays of light become divergent. These are never, ever, ever going to meet. And as a result, you're never going to get a nice image formed. That's annoying. But kind of cool. Because if I randomly place a person's eye here, Really terrible drawing of an eyeball coming up. So there's a curvy eyeball. There's an iris pupil in here. There we go. Attractive. When two rays of light enter your eye and they get refracted onto your retina and they're carrying the exact same piece of information, your eye goes, ah, that's from the same point. Very clever. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, no problem at all. Uh, so your, your eye goes, right, well, light travels in straight lines. So this ray of light came from over here somewhere, which is reasonable. And this ray of light came from over here somewhere. And if I can make them actually look like they were straight lines, that would help. That's better. So your brain then works out that this ray of light actually came from here, as opposed to from here. Right. Your brain then puts together what you should see. Now, if you didn't know that already, you don't see what's actually there. You see what your brain tells you the light tells you about. Which is, broadly speaking, pretty reliable, but in this case isn't, because it puts the top of the object here. And instead of giving you the actual picture of the object, it gives you this. It gives you a much bigger version of it. And it's further away. You don't see this ever. This vanishes from sight. Yeah, because your brain is unaware that that's there, you get this instead. And this is how a magnifying glass works. This image is different. Okay, For a start, it's not real anymore. It's virtual. And you'll hear this in class a lot. Uh, what's a real image? This is a virtual image. But what is a virtual image? A virtual image, by definition, is an image where no rays of light actually cross. Okay, no rays of light actually, well, rather than cross, pass through it. That would be a better way to put it. And that's the way the CE examiners put it. All right, so virtual, no rays of light actually pass through it. Shay, I wouldn't slag off somebody else's teacher. Your teacher's pretty crap too. Okay, so we've got a virtual object here. It's not really there. We're being fooled into thinking of that. It's also not um, inverted anymore. This time it is upright. If you're super, super keen on using the word erect, that's perfectly fine as well. You can use that one. Okay, so it's virtual. It is upright. All right. It is not necessarily beyond 2F. It depends on the size of the object. Okay, but it is further from the lens. I kind of want to say it's farther from the lens. Uh, anybody doing like GCSE really, really special... Uh, English can let me know that. Okay, and of course, the real reason here that we're using it is it's magnified, M A G N I F I E D, magnified, and it's magnified on the same side of the lens as the object. Okay, so it's further from the lens and it's on the same side as the object. So this is how a magnifying glass is useful. Different to it being a magnified image on a projector, which has the object on one side of the lens, the image on the other side. This has to have it on the same side. That's why when you use a magnifying glass, the real object disappears and the bigger kind of picture gets seen there. 
but it's also the reason why a magnifying glass doesn't keep magnifying because as you move the magnifying glass away and away and away and away and away and away and away eventually it gets beyond f and you go back to having this thing here so you stop getting that that effect so your magnifying glass is only good from o to f all right and finally and hopefully i can just do a lot of undos and get rid of this do 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 do, do. undo that we'll keep our scaling here what if it's at f okay so we've done further than f closer than f at f is also interesting once again same rules parallel to the principal axis force through f object from the top again force through o i need to make sure that i get this kind of right it has to go through actually f and my measurements need to be pretty good It's not bad. Okay, now if I had this drawn in graded paper, it would look a bit better, but that's all right. What happens here is that unlike the previous version where the rays were divergent, uh, these rays actually end up parallel to each other. So they're never going to converge on this side of the lens. So we immediately try our little trick of let's get an eyeball in here, you know, draw in our human eyeball. That was, this is an even worse effort than the previous one. That's pretty terrible. Give it some eyelashes. You know, make an effort. Your brain sees that and goes, all right, cool. This ray of light came from over here. Oh, get a dotty light, get a dotty one because it's not real. And if something's not real in a diagram and in a light diagram, we draw it as dots. You know, like your normal is drawn as dots um, in the refraction stuff. They trace back. Your brain never, ever, ever finds this. It never works out where this ray of light comes from. So instead of getting a nice sharp image that you can see, you just get a haze of color. All right, happy enough. So this is what we've got here. We've got parallel rays of light. This is, you've been thinking about it, well, this is absolutely no use. And it's not any use for forming an image. But if you have something like, um, if you're running a stage show or you're, um, a, you're a lighting expert and you've got a comedian on stage or something like that, and you want to follow them around with a spotlight, what you do is you put the filament of your lamp here at F you put a lens there, and what you end up with is a nice cone of light that doesn't spread out. It doesn't get tighter. It doesn't get it doesn't get uh, dis uh, kind of dispersed all over the place. And as a result, you get this nice circle that follows it around. All right, happy, good. So this is our situations with lenses and light. Last thing that I want to do with you is how do you find the focal length of a lens? if you're just in the lab, okay? And how to do that is you need a distant object. If you get a distant object that's far enough away, right, so if I put a little object here, that's pretty close, uh, and any rays of light coming from the top of it will go where? out like that, and out like that, and they'll be divergent. But if I put a big enough distance between my lens and my far away object, so put as big a distance as I can, and considering that this is the size of the lens, like this distance here is only about, what, 50 centimeters or so, then the angle between the rays of light that are coming from it gets smaller. Like that's quite a big angle, quite divergent. This is a smaller angle, not overly divergent. As I go further and further and further back, also I can draw more, I can draw piles of lines in here, like piles and piles and piles of rays. Whereas in here, I can draw less. Still draw quite a few, but I can draw less. Can you imagine a situation where if I got this object sufficiently far away, only one ray would actually meet? Only one ray would actually come through and hit this lens, and the ray that would come through and hit the lens would be parallel to the principal axis. In fact, the only one that would come from anywhere on it would be parallel to the principal axis. That's hard to imagine on a scale like this, but if we got far enough away and far enough away and far enough away, that would become true. And if I got far enough away, they would all be parallel to each other. And we call that distance, the distance that's far enough away, infinity. Because it's only when you get infinitely far away that all this would actually happen. But in light, there's a point that's not at infinity that might as well be. And this is kind of tricky, but let's, let's go for this. If we said the, um, the angle of, uh, or the angle between rays, right, we want it to be basically zero for it to be perfectly parallel. When it's nice and, and, and distance to lens, this is kind of the hardest bit of the whole thing, so stay with me. 
Well, when you're nice and close to the lens up here, the rays of light can be really, really, really divergent. So I end up with kind of a really big angle between these rays. But as I get further and further and further and further and further away from the lens, this graph comes down and comes down and comes down and comes down and comes down. It never quite reaches zero, but it gets closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to zero to it eventually ends up at zero once you're an infinitely long distance away. But there's kind of a point here where you're basically at zero. Like you might as well be at zero. And at that point there, we call infinity for all intents and purposes. This is practically infinity. But it's not actually at infinity, it's at a place. And for most lenses that you'll come across in the lab, infinity is about five meters away. All right, that seems stupid. Where, like, infinity is a long, long, long way away. Five meters is infinity. But imagine you're an atom and you're told to go five meters. Yeah, like, that's a long way. That might as well be infinity. You know, if I, if I ask you to read 10 million pages of a book, like I've basically asked you to read an infinite amount of stuff for all intents and purposes. Though 10 million is unbelievably far away from an actual infinity. You know, and the true, same is true in light. Infinity, about five meters will do it. And if I get an object that's further than five meters away, like, I don't know, a tree outside. This is a tree. I promise you, this is a tree. Um, outside your window. So there's a little window. Doing this on the fly. Oh, shouldn't have had an hour there. there. There we go, one window. And I hold up a lens inside the classroom. So that this distance that it is away is greater than say five meters. Five meters is arbitrary by the way. It's like some lens it's further, some, but somewhere around that. Then basically any ray of light that actually arrives at my lens is parallel. So in order to find the focal length of my lens, to actually find where f is, I just need to get myself a screen or a bit of paper and move it backwards and forwards around the lens. And it'll be like blurry, 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 blurry. Ooh, that was interesting. No, it's gone blurry again. And when you find the bit that perfectly gives you a nice, lovely, 